when I uh, was was asked to say something about this, you know, naturally one's inclination as an academic is sort of try to peel away, um, you know, these terms uh, that we've got, but also to perhaps to set, you know, the anxieties we have uh, about this vocabulary in, um, you know, in some sort of context. What is it that's going on that has caused so much uh, anxiety? It's suggestive, of course, this idea about endless wars of something to do with strategic success rather than measuring things by operational success. I'm sure Beatrice has already made that point. Um, it's also suggestive of how to achieve strategic success. Um, and the word endless suggests something protracted, and persistent. And it is very striking that the United States is talking about persistent competition. Uh, the Chief of Defence Staff of the United Kingdom only in December uh, of last year uh, said that uh, there was a phenomenon of constant competition. And if you look at the, in the cyber realm, of course, we're very struck by the fact that there is this uh, APT concept. I'm sure that will come up later on this afternoon, um, the advanced persistent threat uh, problem. But what I can say about that is, first of all, uh, as all international relations scholars know and historians, is that competition is always constant. Uh, it is the normal condition for capitalist economics. Uh, it's evident, for example, in employment, sports, uh, consumer behavior, even amongst siblings. Uh, it is a natural condition um, and it need not uh, impose any fear in us. In international relations, um, I think one of the things that's now becoming evident to us, again, uh, for perhaps the first time since the Cold War, is that. Uh, States uh, are um, on one side of the spectrum cooperative. Uh, they can be natural allies. Then you can have a status uh, which is slightly more about rivalry, um, which is competitive. You can then have uh, confrontation, which uh, is uncomfortable, but nevertheless tolerable for sovereign states. You can have coercion, uh, which is intolerable because it is an infringement of national sovereignty uh, and yet it's still short of armed conflict. And then of course you can have armed conflict itself, the so-called Article 5 scenario. And each of these categories is characterized by certain actions, behaviors, and conditions. And I think right now, although we're using the term uh, endless or competitive, what we're really talking uh, what really creates that anxiety that's led to us to even hold this event is this problem of strategic coercion. We are being compelled to act or respond in ways which otherwise we would not do in international relations. And when we look at our own history in the United Kingdom, in France, United States, there is a preference in our countries for decisive victories for outcomes, but they are remarkably rare. Um, we do not end every war with 1945, uh, some tremendous victory. Most conflicts in history, some, again, I'm sure Professor Heuser has pointed out, most conflicts end uh, rather unsatisfactorily, you might say, without a decisive victory, um, even if there are operational uh, decisive outcomes. I think particularly between Peers, between powers which are evenly matched, uh, you can find um, this problem of, uh, of not having a decisive outcome. Um, this is uh, very much relevant to the uh, illusion of quick victory, the idea that you might succeed in conflict very, very fast. Most Western countries prefer short conflicts, but rarely do they actually get them. Um, it is striking, isn't it, that you know, if you look back at some of the great works of military history, there used to be a sort of a genre of decisive victories of the world, you know, were very popular amongst military aficionados. Um, and yet, actually, real war uh, is not like that at all. I think it's quite difficult for us to grasp the idea of success uh, or winning uh, without obvious results. But endless wars and protraction might actually be preferable to the highly destructive and lethal wars that short, decisive victories seem to suggest. What I mean is a longer term posture, longer term actions, what the Duke of Wellington uh, called the sure game, might be 
better in that it creates certainty, whereas short wars create dramatic uncertainty. Battles, as Karl von Clausewitz reminded us, battles are the most uncertain of all, even though his theory privileged them. Invariably, theorists of war prefer decisive results. Uh, if we look at uh, Zunzer, for example, uh, despite his preference for certainty, um, he saw the danger of trying to pursue short victories, felt that you should only engage in battle or some kind of attempt at military victory if you already knew the strategic outcome. In other words, battle or war was only the product of a longer period of strategic and diplomatic maneuver. Even Clausewitz um, was troubled by this problem. His conclusion was that for a state, it was far better to achieve a rapid result, however destructive that might be. Despite, despite the obvious success that he himself had witnessed in Russia, or indeed that he was aware of uh, by the end of the Napoleonic Wars in the so-called Peninsula Campaign, where Spain, Portugal, and Britain had worn down French armies uh, in uh, the Iberian Peninsula. It was interesting too, that there was such a lot of enthusiasm for the ideas of Julio Due uh, in the interwar years, that air power promised decisive, quick outcomes, and yet in the Second World War did not produce that. Yes, huge amounts of destruction, but Germany was not defeated in a matter of days or weeks, as Douay would have suggested. Indeed, it took years to reduce even the industrial capacity of Germany, and there was no revolution uh, against the regime in charge. Instead, I think we should look at some other theorists, like Sir Julian Corbett, um, the naval historian uh, and analyst of the turn of the last century. He did advocate the idea, the advantage of what you might call a fleet in being, um, a presence, he thought the war should be waged as a guerre du cross um, against the supplies of your adversary. And the most recent work on that by Andrew Lambert, I really commend to all of us uh, to, to look at. In his conception, then, commerce was central, the economy was the most important aspect uh, for your victory. Even um, William Pitt the Elder would have agreed that trade is your last entrenchment, you must defend it or perish. Economic survival and certainty is surely preferable to the uncertainty of a so-called quick victory or war. Yes, it does require endurance and sustainment, but if you aren't risking um, battles on a regular basis, you are in a position to marshal your resources for that purpose. War might be conducted, said Corbett, on peripheries. In his era, um, he was thinking about the Crimean War, so indeed some of the Elizabethan times. Coalitions, he felt, were absolutely vital in that form of peripheral warfare. Lessons for us, I think, in an information cyber age. And then we might turn finally to the uh, classic example of the Cold War, which I'm sure um, Professor Hoyes has talked about. And again, apologies for missing that. Containment or active defense uh, must surely be um, a preferable policy to that of trying to pursue um, some short, if destructive, victory. Britain's blockade of Germany in the First World War may not produce rapid results, uh, but it was in the end an obvious uh, victory or success. Today, uh, and I noticed that I'm delighted to see that Peter Singer's uh, on this uh, conference. Um, Peter and I, I remember having an exchange uh, some years ago when we visited United Arab Emirates together. And in that conversation, if you remember it, Peter, uh, we actually talked about uh, the singular importance in today of denying uh, the adversary, the achievement of his strategic objectives by imposing costs and of trying to compel a, a hostile power to uh, make a choice. They will always make a choice a decision. Our objective is to try and get them in a position where they have to do that. Now, that may again not be done by some warlike operational act, instead by some kind of strategic uh, process. So finally, let me just mention that cyber today is the classic example, cyber and intelligence operations are the classic example of an endless struggle with apparent, apparently no outcome, no victory, um, and yet so close, so very, very important. Closely tied to commerce and banking, closely tied to the importance of nodes and networks, um, important perhaps for 
coalitions, although they're not yet built, protocols also not yet agreed internationally. It requires vigilance, constant adaptation, and that potential power may be a fleeting being rather than actually being used all the time. So in conclusion, I think one can try to look for a strategic victory, which may occur even if you suffer endless operational setbacks, which will be exemplified by the Vietnam War. As long as you achieve your strategic ends, you are a success. You could also look, secondly, at denial of ends, denial of your adversary's strategic ends. These would include, for example, the Battle of the Marne in 1914, or the battles around Moscow in 1941. Pyrrhic, perhaps, but absolutely vital in denying an adversary the achievement of their strategic objectives. Thirdly, Germany's strategic um, uh, posture in the Second World War was a disaster because it privileged uh, operational successes, and in the end, it lost against superior forces and superior resources. World War II was also a war of intelligence and uh, of electronic means. And in that e-warfare, um, the German Enigma codes were broken, which proved to be an absolute strategic game changer, a strategic success without victory. And finally, uh, just a reminder that the Cold War is perhaps the very best example of where we didn't have a war and where we achieved the strategic outcome we desired. Thank you.